So for many of you who are Bowdoin College students, your experiences will shape your memories of the four years that you'll spend here at Bowdoin College. And for some of you, those experiences might tie back to a time in October 2017 when a freakish windstorm hit the campus, <laughs> toppling trees and power lines, and plunging the campus into darkness. And for some of you, you might have found yourself hunkered down by outlets trying to charge those laptops and computers, spending quality time with other people like you might not have taken a shower for several days, just finding your own resilience a bit tested by this event, this unexpected event that we actually had not seen in quite a long time. And like you, I had a similar experience in the community that I live in. I live in a rural community about 10 miles away, and on that day that the storm came into Maine, I found myself for the 20, first time in 25 years not able to leave my street. Every point of egress was blocked by a telephone pole or wires or a tree. And so I thought, as I was trying to figure out what to do and how to get to work, I had two conversations that day that tie in so much to this concept of resilience and community resilience. The first conversation was with a neighbor who is a firefight, volunteer firefighter in my community. And he told me he had been up since 2 in the morning, working with three other people, clearing the debris to allow the utility crews to come in. And I was humbled by the story of his service. I had been safe and dry and warm in my bed all night, not even knowing that he had been working all night to make my life a little bit better. But it was what he said next that really caught me. He said, you know, we're having a really hard time finding people to show up to work and volunteer for the fire department. And I thought, this is something we really have to pay attention to because my neighbor, like many other firefighters, 90% of the firefighters in our communities are volunteer. And so if we're seeing shifts in the ability and willingness of people to contribute, we're seeing some erosion of these first-line responders when we have events like this. The second conversation I had was with some neighbors down the road at the other end of the road when I drove down that way and realized I was not going to get out that way. Um, and, in, and being confronted by the tree that was blocking the road, three people took matters into their own hands, or I should say chainsaws into their own hands, and they cleared the tree off the road, thereby opening up the point of egress for all of us. We could continue on with our day-to-day -day lives. But the message here is the most important thing were the people, the people in my community that stepped up in a time like this and made it possible for us to kind of recover and go on. So I study community resilience. I study the ways in which, in the face of a changing climate, communities prepare for, recover from, and adapt to these changes. And I think a lot about the scale of communities. When we define that, what do we mean? I study rural communities, and a lot of the literature looks at large urban areas. And I think it's really important to think about the scale, and here's why. Every year, the American Association for the Advancement of Science gives out an award called the Golden Goose Award. And that award is given to a researcher, researchers who receive federal funding, um, but in the process of discovering something, they find an unexpected application of their work that addresses a social issue. So in 2015, two researchers looked at ways we can map population densities across the surface of the Earth and looking specifically at elevation. But then they asked a much more important question. They said, so now that we know how to do this, what if we look at where these population dis distributions are in proximity to the coast, near the shore, the places where people are very likely to come in harm's way when we see the effects of sea level rise and storm events? And then they said, and what's the structure of this distribution? Do people live in small towns, big towns, cities? And what they found was really surprising. They found that the vast majority of people who live near the coast actually live in rural communities, communities like mine. And only 10% live in large urban areas. And why that's important is because the structures in place, like our volunteer firefighters and other ways we take care of each other, matter a lot in rural communities. They make a huge difference. So not long ago, I was reading through the town report in my community. It's like the report card for community. It's um, the story of a community, how many people were born last year, how many people died, what's going on? 
And what I saw for the first time ever in the time I've lived there is this language. We are seeing the coldest, we're seeing high temperatures, low temperatures, we're seeing things we've never seen before. And the thing is we need to be ready for whatever's coming down the road. We have to be ready for any weather event. But the other part of this description was we are few serving many. We don't have enough people in our community that are there to help us in times of need. Exactly what my neighbor was talking about two years before. So I thought, well, this is what I study. I'm just noticing this because I study the ways that people talk about climate change and how they come together to solve problems. So I'm going to do a little research. I'm going to go back and read every town report for the last 20 years and see if I see any changes. I'm also going to look to see if that tracks against what's happening at a state level. And so here's what I found. When I go back about 20 years ago, the stories are, this is the most exciting year in the department's history. What we see is, is a description of vibrancy, people showing up, being on the fire department, but more importantly, doing fundraisers, getting equipment bought for the, for the town to, to help benefit all the community members. So things had shifted. And what was particularly important is that a little over 20 years ago, as this was actually being written, the ice storm of 1998 slammed into, Mar into Maine and the Maritimes. And over 840,000 people were without power for three weeks. So imagine those three days in October to two or three weeks um, in Maine. And over $300 million worth of damage was done. It was cold. We did not have cell phones back there or social media. So what happened? We did OK. Of the 840,000 people at one point who had lost power, only a few thousand had to take shelter. Because we stepped up, we took care of each other, we helped neighbors, we had that social capital in place. The thing that my neighbor was alluding to, the thing that that town report was talking about. So as we think about our communities and we think about what puts us at risk, being next to a beautiful coastline means that sometimes we are going to be in harm's way of flooding, sea level rise. And our first response, and, and where a lot of our energy is going now, is to think about the physical. We will build buildings higher. We will make sure our bridges are stronger. We'll do as in the case of the ice storm of 1998. We will cut trees back away from the power line so that when we lose, we have a big event again, we're less likely to lose power. So we focused a lot on the physical infrastructure, ba basically ensuring we have physical resilience in our communities. And that's an important thing to do. But what's also important is we have to really pay attention to the social fabric of our communities. Who's there to help take care of each other? How do we make that stronger? How do we make our communities more socially resilient? And we should be looking at both of those in exactly the same way. So how do we go forward? How do we make our communities more resilient? Well, the good news is there's some really good research out there that really points out ways and things we can do to make our communities resilient. And just a few of these things are, one thing, having local food systems is a really important thing. Our ability to produce food locally is a factor that contributes to communities' resilience. When we look at what happens in the face of events, that matters. The other thing that matters is planning. Even though we don't really know what's coming down the pike, sitting down, figuring out where we're vulnerable, what we're going to do about it matters. Because when we look at communities and how they've responded, having had some plan in place has mattered. And another thing to look at, and again, this is particularly in rural communities, is letting natural systems do the work, the best work they can do. We know that wetlands helps against buffering for flooding, but we can, we can learn from those systems. We can buttress and strengthen our shorelines using these systems that actually work. But what is the most important factor that makes our communities resilient? It's community capital. When we look at the numbers of things like how many organizations are there, what is the level of volunteerism, even levels of voting, when we look at those numbers and we come up with a metric called community capital, we see that that makes a tremendous difference in terms of the ways that communities are resilient. So at this point, we may feel like we are at a crossroads. It may feel very overwhelming in the face of things that we can't even anticipate. But here's one thing we can all do. We can be the best members of our community. We can participate support our local food systems. We can show up and connect with people who may be doing those plans that are so important. We can volunteer, because in doing all those acts, we actually contribute to the one thing that really matters, strengthening the social fabric of our communities, ensuring in that way that we can try and make 
our future as resilient as possible. Thank you.